Uh, what we start with this afternoon is the Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture, sponsored by James Walker. And uh, this lecture will be presented by J. Houston McCulloch. Um, Hugh McCulloch received his Ph.D. from the University of Chicago in 1973. He taught for six years at Boston College and then moved on to Ohio State University, from which he retired just last year. He has been an NBER research fellow and editor of the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. His research interests include money and banking, finance, econometrics, and industrial organization. He currently resides in New York and is a visiting scholar at NYU. Um, I'm very happy to introduce to you Hugh McCulloch, who will address us on Misesian Insights for Modern Macroeconomics. Well, thank you, Joe. I'd like to uh, thank Joe, in particular, and the Mises Institute for uh, inviting me to speak here. It's a, a great honor to uh, give the Ludwig von Mises uh, lecture. Um, the uh, actually got into uh, economics through von Mises' uh, uh, many of von Mises' books, uh, like Roger, I got in through the Ayn Rand uh, bookstore uh, uh, angle in, uh, as an undergraduate. And um, so the, uh, I think the first book I read in economics was The Theory of Money and Credit, which was quite a trip. I didn't understand anything of it at the time. Um, <coughs> and then I read uh, Human Action, and uh, some of his other books I liked were The Liberalism and um, uh, Omnipotent Governments, a very interesting history of Statism in Germany, actually, and theory and history is a very important uh, ph philosophical book. Um, I never actually read socialism through, but uh, it's kind of summarized, the idea is summarized in human action. Um, it's a very important uh, uh, concept I'll be getting to in my talk today. Um, oh, the, uh, I didn't make it to the South Royalton Conference. I did, make to, I did go to the uh, following year's Hartford Conference, and... Uh, uh, Larry Moss gave a follow-up of his magic tricks, and uh, I can see it was indeed a uh, epistemological crisis from a Miranda's point of view to uh, have uh, Larry pulling all these stunts off here. <coughs> well, today I'd like to talk about, um, well, Mises had several insights for modern economics. I'd like to talk about four in particular that relate to modern macroeconomics. <coughs> um, uh, there's been an unfortunate tendency, I think, for the Austrians to isolate themselves from mainstream economics. It seems to me they should be trying to incorporate Austrian ideas into mainstream economics rather than uh, going off on a, a pure separate path. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the, what he called the historical transmission of the value of money, um, which um, relates to the uh, price adjustment mechanism. And as a corollary is uh, the concept of market equilibrium as opposed to the popular, uh, quote, rational expectations equilibrium. Um, so I disagree with Harry about the, uh, how great, how Austrian the uh, rational expectations is. Um, another very important insight is the uh, concept of heterogeneous inconvertible capital, which actually is a, um, this uh, epistemological problems of economics, uh, the last chapter in that is on uh, inconvertible capital, and it's a very concise statement of uh, von Mises' view on that. Um, and... Um, this contrasts sharply with neoclassical homogeneous capital. I think it's a much better, uh, much more uh, uh, valuable concept. And finally, um, the nature of the liquidity effect, uh, is, in fact, relates the Taylor rule to the quantity theory of money. Well, first, the um, historical transmission of the value of money. Uh, uh, von Mises had a contemporary named Helferich who argued that uh, marginal utility could not explain the general price level. Um, Hilferick, uh, this is a quote from the Theory of Money and Credit, uh, 24, or the 1953 translation of the 24 edition, uh, pages 119 to 20. Uh, Hilferick is of the opinion that there is <clears throat> an insurmountable obstacle in the way of applying the marginal utility theory to the problem of money. For while the marginal utility theory attempts to base the exchange value of goods on the degree of their usefulness to the individual, the degree of usefulness of money to the individual quite obviously depends on its exchange value since money can have utility only if it has exchange value, at least paper money. And the degree of its usefulness is determined by the level of, of that exchange value. Money is valued subjectively according to the amount of consumable goods that can be obtained in exchange for it, or according to what other goods have to be given in order to obtain the money needed for making payments. The marginal utility of money to any individual, that is the uh, marginal utility derivable from the goods that can be obtained with the given quantity of money, or that must be surrendered for the required money, presupposes a certain exchange value of money, 
so that the latter, according to Helfrich, cannot be derived from the former. So this is what I call the, uh, well, this is Helfrich's argument in uh, equations that uh, uh, marginal utility states that relative prices are ratios of marginal utilities. Um, if you have two goods, I and J, um, uh, their endowments kind of determines their marginal utilities, and that was going to determine the ratio of their uh, market prices. But Helfrich said this is circular for nominal prices since the absolute price of good I is its marginal utility divided by the marginal utility of money um, to be spent on all goods other than good I, which I've represented by I hat here. Yet that marginal utility is determined by all goods, by the prices of, by the same reasoning, by the prices of all goods other than good J, including good I itself. Um, so there seems to be a, circular, uh, a circularity here. So I call this the vicious circle of Helferich. Um, so here's the price of good I is determined by the marginal utility of money in exchange for goods other than I. That, in turn, is determined by the price of good J for I not equal to J, um, which, in turn, is determined by the same mechanism from PI itself. So it seems to be a circular argument here. Um, Von Mises' reply was that um, those who have realized the significance of historically transmitted values in the, in the determination of the objective exchange value of money will not find great difficulty in escaping from this apparently circular argument. It is true that the subjective valuation of money presupposes an existing objective exchange, objective exchange value, that means opportunity for exchange, but the value that has to be presupposed is not the same as the value that has to be explained. <clears throat> what has to be presupposed is yesterday's exchange value. And it is quite legitimate to use it as an explanation of that of today. The objective exchange value of money which rules in the market today is derived from yesterday's under the influence of the subjective values of individuals frequenting the market, just as yesterday's in turn, in its turn, was derived under the influence of subjective valuations from the objective exchange value possessed by money the day before yesterday. Um, so the uh, uh, added some emphasis here. Um, so I, this is what I call the benign helix of Mises. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Jim McGinnis said this. You know, this uh, diagram is a little screwy, but uh, anyway. The uh, um, so the uh, so here I've added time subscripts or time superscripts on all these prices and marginal utilities. The price of good I at time t is determined by the marginal utility of money at time t in exchange for goods other than I, but that's determined by prices of other goods at time, some earlier time, t minus lambda, where lambda is the average lag of the price information, which in turn is determined by the price of good I itself day before yesterday, time t minus 2 lambda. So basically, you're, when you're, um, the only thing you know about in the present is what you're currently engaged in. Everything else you think you know about because of past experience with it. So this morning there was Magnolia Avenue out here in front of the Mises Institute. For all we know, right now it's a cornfield, but uh, odds are that it's still, it's still Magnolia Avenue. Uh, that's the way things usually work. Usually, uh, so usually there's enough continuity in the economy that yesterday basically it was the same people with the same tastes and the same endowments pretty much with just minor modifications. So pretty much yesterday's prices, today's prices, tomorrow's prices are going to be similar to yesterday's prices, maybe adjusted for uh, trends like inflation. Um, so um, the um, uh, so this leads to von Mises' theory of how prices adjust to a increase in the money supply. Uh, an increase in the uh, com community stock of money always means an increase in the amount of money held by a number of economic agents. Uh, for these persons, the ratio between the demand for money and the stock of it is altered. They have a relative superfluity of money and a relative shortage of other economic goods. The immediate consequence is that the marginal utility to them of the monetary unit diminishes, as when you get more money, your marginal utility of that money, which you can spend on other goods, uh, uh, the drive marginal utility goes down. Um, and they will now express in the market their demand for the objects they desire, whose quantity and physical quantity is fixed, and so whose marginal utility isn't going to change much. Um, more intensely than before is the obvious result of this that the prices of the goods concerned will rise and that the objective exchange value of money will fall. So the injection of money raises prices, 
that actually reduces, when there's an excess supply of money, uh, the um, injection of money raises prices and will reduce the real value of that money somewhat and reduce the excess supply of money somewhat. But then he goes on that the this rise in prices will by no means be restricted to the market for those goods that are desired by those who originally have the new money. In addition, those who have brought these goods to market will have their incomes and their proportionate stocks of money increased. And in their turn, will be in a position to demand more intensively the goods that they want because the marginal utility to them of money has gone down because they got this windfall uh, profit from the uh, what they thought was a windfall profit. Um, so these goods will also rise. Thus, the increase in prices continues having a diminishing effect until all commodities to a greater or some to a lesser effect are reached by it. Um, so this is, in modern terms, this is basically a partial adjustment mechanism that the, um, in the first round of exchange, you go a little bit toward equilibrium and the next uh, round of exchange, what's left over gets reduced further and then further. So there's successive price increases which successively reduce this excess supply of money and eventually get the price level increased more or less in proportion to the uh, money stock. So um, um, the um, uh, so this leads to um, uh, what I call the um, uh, equation I call the moderate quantity theory of money. Uh, this is a partial adjustment mechanism for the price level, uh, kind of based on this Misesian argument. So um, in a working paper I wrote back in 1980. Um, it's either on my, I mean, uh, I'll check and see if it's on my, make sure it's on my webpage. Um, the uh, inflation rate at time t, uh, uh, pi is inflation, is going to be proportional to the excess supply of money. Um, it's going to be determined by three things. The first is going to be the excess supply of money, which is this uh, Misesian effect of driving the price level up. Um, in addition, um, since we take those prices yesterday and adjust them for any obvious trends for inflation. This is basically what uh, uh, Jim Grant called uh, Kentucky windage the other day. I had to look that up. Uh, but basically the idea there is if you're pointing at a target and uh, the wind's blowing, you, you do a scientific estimate of the wind velocity and then adjust your rifle and then shoot it and it hits, uh, hits the target. Uh, so uh, people use a seat of the pants adjustment for inflation uh, informing their inflationary expectations, informing their prices, informing their expectations of the future pr- purchasing power of money, um, <clears throat> of the prices of these other goods that they're going to get to spend their money on if they don't spend it on the immediate good. Um, and then um, a third factor is simply micro noise. Most of the price changes that take place are really just micro noise. Um, so, um, uh, the, uh, so in this paper, I tell a story about what this coefficient would look like. It would depend on the elasticity of marginal utility with respect to real wealth of the re- over, and, and also real wealth over the to- relevant uh, horizon, and also this average lag of price information. So this um, is a, a big alternative to the real adjustment mechanism that Philip Kagan put forward in 1956, and that people like Chow and Goldfeld have used to estimate the demand for money. As long as the money supply is constant, it's basically the same equation. It has the, basic, the same price adjustment mechanism. But um, if the money supply changes, the real adjustment mechanism actually predicts that the price level will perfectly track the money supply, which is totally unrealistic and not at all what we want in a partial adjustment mechanism. So this is a much better um, equation than this popular real adjustment. Goldfeld proposed a nominal adjustment equation, which makes sense in a fixed exchange rate regime, but... Uh, not when the money supply is exogenous. Um, this is essentially equivalent to very much like the so-called P-star model of Hallman, Porter, and Small that was in the AER in 1991. Um, so they, they didn't mention Mises, but it seems like a very Misesian argument they have that basically the price level adjusted the monetary disequilibrium. They, they threw in some lags of inflation, which are going to pick up the expected inflation. <coughs> um, so... Uh, so I think this is a much better approach to the inflationary dynamics. <clears throat> and another corollary of this uh, historical transmission of the value of money is um, the concept of market equilibrium. Um, according to fashionable, uh, quote, rational expect- the extremist form of, quote, uh, rational expectations equilibrium, um, each agent knows all information about everyone else's tastes, 
everyone else's endowments, everyone else's production opportunities, plus current policy, plus policymakers' intentions about the future, and then they calculate the equilibrium uh, from all this knowledge. So that's basically the extreme form that Muth proposed in 1960. Um, now, the von Mises socialism economic calculation argument points out this is totally unrealistic. I mean, uh, even th- uh, government agency with thousands of economists and supercomputers can't perform this calculation. Here, Joe Schmo is supposed to be cal- performing this calculation when deciding whether to take a $8 job offer or a $8.30 job offer, um, or whether, whether or not to take a, a given job offer. So um, <clears throat> for some purposes, this can be a useful exercise. I mean, you can make a toy economy and a toy policy and say, well, does this policy make sense if people really know how it's going to work? I mean, that's a useful exercise. But as a description of how the economy actually works, it's, it's totally unrealistic. And um, Fritz Machlup, uh, once uh, in an unpublished note, once pointed out that uh, the, um, this whole term rational is misleading in this context, <clears throat> that Rationality does not imply omniscience. Um, that um, uh, uh, it's an abuse of terminology to call this uh, rationality. Um, the uh, I'd argue that equ- equilibrium expectations is a better name for it because it is sometimes a useful exercise. So you shouldn't say you're going to assume rationality. You should say you're going to assume endogeneity or equilibriumness. <laughs> um, the uh, recently Sargent and others who were among the original proponents of this uh, admitted that this is too extreme and uh, are starting to advocate what they call bounded rationality. Uh, I'd say that's another misnomer um, because if you're, if you're only 30% rational, then you're 70% mentally incompetent. So uh, um, on the other hand, if you're 30, only 30% omniscient, then you're 70% human. So... I'd say bounded omniscience is a better term for what Sargent's talking about than bounded rationality. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I bump into Sargent at NYU occasionally, but I haven't uh, grilled him on this yet. Um, the, um, uh, the Mises offered the alternative that uh, people don't know what the, how the economy works. They just observe past prices. Um, m- vendors observe the quantities they've, they, they themselves were able to sell. And they trust that future prices will be similar, or at least extrapolated for obvious trends. <clears throat> and then um, if the economy is static, everyone has the same tastes, same endowments every period, the market will actually find the equilibrium. If the economy is changing all the time, which it really does, at least the market is moving toward the equilibrium reasonably efficiently. It doesn't really get to the equilibrium, but it uh, moves us toward it as, as well as can be uh, um, done. Uh, without anyone knowing what that equilibrium is. Um, So, um, but the expectations of these agents are basically empirical, not omniscient. uh, Agents determine, forecast tomorrow's price of gasoline the same way economists do. They drive by three gas stations and take the median price, and that's probably (laughs) what the price of gas is going to be tomorrow. Um, And uh, so... um, Austrian economics is usually prides itself being theoretical rather than empirical, but it's really a theory of empirical agents, I'd argue, because the agents themselves are purely empirical. They just say, well, water was a dollar a bottle yesterday. It's probably going to be similar today. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I guess I can slow down a little bit. I'm running. <laughs> Good timing. Um, the third uh, Misesian insight um, is um, the concept of heterogeneous inconvertible capital. Uh, this contrasts with the so-called uh, with the neoclassical growth model, according to which uh, uh, consumption plus investment, the change in capital, is output minus depreciation. So here, uh, capital is just a homogeneous mass, uh, and uh, it's identical regardless of the intended product, uh, of what specific product you're trying to produce, or even uh, the date of the output that you're trying to produce. In fact, in this formulation, it's exactly the same good as aggregate consumption. So I think of this as a bag of, uh, it's a useful toy economy to try to solve, but it's, um, it's as if the only economy, the only good in the economy besides labor was bags of wheat, 
you can either eat the wheat or you can plant it. And if you plant it, it'll come up next year. Uh, you can devote a lot of labor to p- scratching the ground well and planting it well, or you can so you can have variable proportions of capital and labor. Uh, but it's a very uh, trivial e- economy. <clears throat> now, in uh, this essay, Inconvertible Capital, in the Epistemological Problems of Economics and Elsewhere in Human Action and, and so forth, and in Theory of Many Credit, he uh, <clears throat> insists that um, L- 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 takes Bumba Verk's concept that capital is the produced means of production, and also Bumba Verk's concept that production takes time and may have several steps that involve the production of uh, capital types that are specific to the um, particular type of output that is intended. And if you start with a capital mix that's appropriate for one output mix and then change your mind and want to build another output mix after you've already built the capital that was appropriate for the first one, uh, that's going to be costly. <coughs> um, and uh, in itself, this is a macro, a micro problem, but macroeconomically, um, the, the intertemporal mix of output also matters, and the capital mix that you are going to choose is to some extent specific to the intertemporal choice of output that you want. Um, and um, if you have a um, this equ- the um, Intertemporal mix is going to be governed by real interest rates, a little R here. So a disequilibrium real interest rate due, for example, to stop-go credit expansion um, is going to cause malinvestment in the, wrong intertem- in the wrong mix of capital. It's not too much capital or too little capital, but the wrong mix of capital because it's targeting the wrong point in the future. Um, so this malinvestment, Austrian malinvestment concept that Mises, keeps, Mises and Hayek keep talking about is not even an issue in this neoclassical growth model, because there only is one kind of capital. It's all, it's all just one kind of stuff. Um, you, could have a little bit, you could have too much consumption and not enough investment, or vice versa. Um, but um, you can't have the wrong kind of capital. <clears throat> so um, uh, Mises was not very graphical at all, or wasn't graphical at all. Uh, in his pure theory of capital, Hayek tried to um, quanti- show il- graphically what was meant by this, but he wasn't very mathematically adept either and uh, didn't really succeed in that and and getting across what was meant here, I don't think. Um, So I think a a better way of looking at this is in terms of the uh, production possibility frontier, or PPF. Um, This was used in an intertemporal context by Irving Fisher uh, in his uh, theory of interest, which he dedicates to Bumba Verk and John Ray and basically is just Bumba Verk in diagrams. Um, so I'd say, in, at least in this book, Irving Fisher is an Austrian economist. <laughs> um, the uh, production possibility frontier itself was developed by Edgeworth, who was more of a Valrasian, um, but it was generalized um, to a it's just a general linear production model by the Austro-Hungarian mathematician John von Neumann, who um, was instrumental in developing linear programming. In fact, the the shadow prices in linear programming are basically the imputed value, Mengerian imputed values from a, in a production uh, context. Um, so um, in his, um, his linear production model includes, incorporates complementarity, substitution, joint outputs, um, and um, is really just a mathematical statement of Menger's production model. Um, <coughs> um, but it, it, uh, its hallmark is that he has production activities. Uh, he has production activities that use inputs subject to linear constraints and then produce outputs linearly. And um, the fact that you're bumping into these linear constraints means that first off, marginal products are going to diminish in the Menger type way. Um, isoquants are going to be quasi concave in the usual manner. Um, and production possibility sets, the set under the frontier is going to be a convex set. So the convexity is all over the place here, um, uh, basically using a Mengerian uh, argument. He, I don't know that he actually read Menger, but he collaborated with, Otto, with Oscar Morgenstern and uh, uh, was himself Austro-Hungarian, so I'm assuming he did read Menger. Um, anyway, so the production possibility f- frontier 
Uh, Edgeworth gave some specific examples. Von Neumann's uh, model shows this very, very general. Um, so generally, this frontier bows, bows out away from the origin. Um, producers will try to maximize the, the value of their output by picking the point on this that maximizes the, um, the value of the output. So if Y is expensive, is going to be is costly, you'll pick a point like A. If X is relatively costly, you'll pick a point like B um, in order to maximize your profits. You, you try to get to the boundary of this frontier, the, the boundary of the set, which is the frontier. Um, now, the usual story, like Edgeworth's story, is that, okay, well, it's just capital and labor, and there's two production functions, one for X, one for Y, with different capital intensities, and so you get this frontier, but there's still only one kind of capital, and in fact, no production of capital. But let's uh, suppose that production has two steps. Um, this is capitalist production, and the first step that carries you from time, excuse me, from time one to time two, <coughs> you use your initial endowment at time one to produce capital types which become available at t- time two. And then at time two, you use these capital types to produce either X and or Y um, at time three. <clears throat> so if this is the time one production possibility frontier, at time two, you no longer have all these production possibilities. You have a subset of them. You, if you're shooting for point A, you can still produce point A because you produce the capital appropriate for it. But um, basically, everywhere else, the production possibility frontier will have shrunken. <coughs> and uh, you're not locked into A. You still have substitutability. You can still change your plan. But um, you can never get back to point B. It's, it's foregone because you produced the wrong mix for point B. Um, in fact, the, you can show from this that if goods are normal, the, the prices will actually have to overshoot if you were... Um, <coughs> Um, if, um, if you were expecting these prices to prevail in the market, you would aim for point A. Um, if consumer tastes really were for um, point B, so these would be the equilibrium prices. If you were expecting the wrong prices and shot for A, um, you will um, produce A, but then those consumer tastes will put you on this production possibility frontier, and an even um, X will become even. More, more costly than, you, uh, than it would have been if you had known the uh, shot for point B and then was appropriate for point B. So there's an over, actual overshooting of the price uh, when you correct this way. Um, so this worked, this is just micro from one period, one goods at one point in time, but the same thing, well, well if you were shooting for point B, then you'd have this uh, green production possibility frontier and could, then could not produce A. Um, so it's important to shoot for the right target to start with. Now, intertemporally, uh, Irving Fisher used the same context to show the intertemporal production possibilities um, um, in this, this theory of interest. He uh, did it for two, two points in time, then for three and n points in time. Um, you need at least three points in time for this to be relevant. Um, so let's uh, say there's three points in time, T1, T2, and T3, uh, consumption, aggregate consumption is C1, C2, and C3 in those three periods. So here's C1, C2, C3. Um, n- pretty much no matter what the technology is, any linear constrained technology is going to give you a convex production possibility set. Um, and producers will try to maximize the present value of output given period one interest rates by picking some point like point, like point A here on the surface. Um, okay. um, now, when we move forward to time two, in order to hit point A, you have to conduct certain production activities in time one and in time two. Your time one production activities are going to pr- produce a mix of capital goods which are appropriate for the particular point you're trying to hit. And as Bloomberg pointed out, the technology may be quite different for C3 production than it is for C2 production. So you might want to um, produce fancier capital equipment or something for more sophisticated capital equipment if you want C3 and if you just want C2. Um, so um, uh, but when you get to period two, um, you've already chosen your C1. There's nothing you can do to, let's see. There's nothing you can do to change the amount of C1, so it's given. So if you were 
shooting from point A back in period one, you've already produced that amount of C1, but you can still trade off C2 against C3. <clears throat> so in period two, only this section through the original PPF is going to be relevant. So we'll just focus on it. So we'll just take that slice of this original curve. We're taking the C1 choice as given now. Um, and we're now we, we can um, trade off C2 against C3. This is the mix that was originally planned. This is the section through the period one production possibility frontier. But now if capital is heterogeneous, if capital were homogeneous, you could still C1 determined period two capital and you're, you still have the same PPF. But if capital is heterogeneous and inconvertible to some extent, then when you get to period two, A is the only point you can still follow through with. You're not locked into A, you can still move away from A, but you can't get in, back to the original PPF because you have the wrong, you have the mix of capital that's appropriate for point A. So, um, um, so if it turns out that, you, that because of uh, taste you really wanted to be consuming up in here or down in here, um, you um, uh, have imposed a cost on the economy by shooting for the wrong point originally, by having the wrong interest rates originally. Um, so I developed this in um, a paper I had in uh, the Journal of Monetary Economics back in 1981, uh, Misintermediation and Business Fluctuations, which is on my webpage. Um, and I call this the Austrian capital effect because it's the, um, it comes from the, this heterogeneity of capital that Mises is talking about um, and shows the um, cost of not uh, of uh, shooting for the wrong intertemporal production point originally. So this um, is central to the uh, Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, I argue in this paper that it's a, it would be a problem even in a uh, um, moneyless economy in which financial intermediaries don't scrupulously match asset and uh, liability maturities. Um, but um, <clears throat> the, uh, so again, this malinvestment is not an issue in the neoclassical model, so this is completely foreign to them, uh, but it's still it's just an objective um, thing that they should understand, be able to understand and agree that this is um, more realistic than the neoclassical model, whether or not you... And then you can start talking about the Austrian business cycle theory. Or whatever. <clears throat> so um, um, now this... Uh, the interest rate that's relevant here is the terms of exchange between period two and period three. Um, so it's the 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 um, interest rate in period two for loans that mature in period three. Those loans existed back in period one as the forward interest rate between period two and period three. So. Um, uh, analyzing this really involves the term structure of interest rates. There isn't just one interest rate. There's, back in period one, there was a whole term structure of interest rates for loans maturing in period two or period three. Those are not necessarily the same interest rate. And what's relevant is the ultimate interest rate relative to that forward interest rate implicit in the term structure. Now, again, the Austrians just talked about one interest rate. There's no term structure in the Austrian literature, but uh, there really logically should be a term structure here to to make sense of, uh, uh, or to analyze this kind of problem. Um, I had a uh, student, uh, Kevin Guo from China, uh, Kevin or Feng Guo, who finished his dissertation in 2013, went back to China um, and kind of uh, analyzed this using U.S. data, U.S. output data. And uh, <clears throat> so the, this, the latest development on the Austrian capital effect, ironically, was um, done by uh, Kevin, who I learned shortly before he graduated, is actually a member of the Communist Party. So the, the communists are at the forefront of Austrian capital theory now. T t t times have changed. So. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so um, the... Um, uh, and well, I should have mentioned, uh, I'm a Chicago graduate, so you should feel free to butt in with questions of clarification as I go along. I, should, I forgot to mention that. But, uh, so any questions... Before I move on here, okay. um, the uh, um, so finally um, um, uh, another uh, insight I get from Mises is the uh, nature of the liquidity effect. Um, there's a wide 
a mainstream, a widespread mainstream misconception that the uh, liquidity effect of a monetary expansion <clears throat> is the reduction in interest rates that are required to induce agents to hold the new money given the price level and the demand for real money balances, given that that probably is, has some interest elasticity. Um, so at lower interest rates, people want to hold more money. You increase the money supply, so interest rates have to go down to where people want to hold that money. Um, now, uh, uh, Mises and said would say that this uh, that the um, liquidity effect of a monetary expansion through the banking system, which is the way it usually works, is the reduction in interest rates required to induce agents to borrow the new money with the primary intention of spending it either on consumption or investment. So it's really the loanable funds model, the Irving Fisher Boom Bavaric loanable funds model of uh, interest rates that's going on here. Um, uh, banks create new money by making new loans. To get people to take out those new loans, they have to offer lower interest rates. Um, but this is not an equilibrium situation. It's a disequilibrium situation. Um, and what they've done is created an excess supply of money in excess of people's demand for it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a, doesn't, does not reflect an equilibrium in the supply and demand for money. It's a dis, it's disequilibrium supply and demand for money. It's an excess supply of money, um, <clears throat> which will persist as long as the real rate's below its equilibrium value and vice versa. So this excess supply of money starts pushing prices up through this price adjustment mechanism. Um, as it does, the real value of the new money falls, the real value of the new loans falls, and the... Uh, interest rate that's necessary to sustain that money, to, to get people to borrow that money, goes back up to the equilibrium value. Um, so the, um, as long as the excess supply of money persists, the real interest rate will be re artificially reduced <coughs> below its equilibrium value, and vice versa. That the, um, If you use the interest rate as a target, as an instrument instead of the money supply, by pushing the interest rates down, you're uh, if the Fed pushes interest rates down, the Fed does that by buying treasury bonds, which is basically lending money to the money markets. The banks build on that by making loans to their customers, which is more loans. Um, when they do that, they are creating new money, which is an excess supply of money, and um, uh, that will be inflationary. So um, this kind of gives you a rationale for how the Taylor rule works. Um, Suppose the Fed doesn't know what the demand for money is. I mean, quantifying the demand for money is tricky. Just measuring is tricky, and um, uh, it changes over time, so estimating is tricky. Um, so suppose the Fed completely gives up on monetarism, say we, we don't know what money, money demand is, we don't even know how to measure money, we'll just look at interest rates. Um, <clears throat> as long as the Fed knows the equilibrium real interest rate, in principle, it can control the excess supply of money by manipulating real interest rates. It's given inflationary expectations by manipulating nominal interest rates. <clears throat> um, now, the big if there is the Fed has to know the equilibrium real interest rate, which it doesn't know either. So the, the way to find the equilibrium real interest rate is to pursue an, a neutral policy and see what the market comes up with. Uh, and you don't know whether your policy is neutral. <laughs> um, and the way to find out what the uh, demand for money is to, is to pursue a uh, neutral policy and see what price level the economy comes up with. Um, so either way, you have to know whether your policy was neutral, which you don't really know. And um, um, it takes – there's a long adjustment mechanism, so um, it takes a long while to figure out what that equilibrium is, even if um, – uh, uh, in any event. So um, – but at least in principle, the um, Fed could reject monetarism and use Taylorism to, to manipulate real interest rates, to manipulate the excess supply of money through the interest rate. Um, so I have been teaching this in my money and banking course. I have a chapter, in fact, called Money and Credit. I, got, I borrowed the title from uh, von Mises uh, uh, with, a, with some fancy diagrams of bank expansion and so forth, showing uh, how this excess supply, the net demand for credit, um, and so for how this, uh, where this excess supply of money fits in. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, 
So in conclusion, um, again, as I mentioned, uh, I think Austrian economists should seek to integrate Austrian theory into mainstream macro, and not to isolate themselves from, or Austrian theory from mainstream macro. And from the macroeconomist point of view, even, even those macroeconomists who do not endorse Mises' policy recommendations, like no intervention and business cycle theory and so forth, um, should pay heed to several of his economic insights, which are uh, basically useful for mainstream macro, uh, even if you don't buy the policy recommendations. Um, so the paper, the slides are on the Mises website. Uh, the, I updated the slides this morning or last night, late last night. So if it says it has a little date in the bottom corner, that's the current version of the slides. Um, I'm working on the paper, so the paper should be on the Mises website uh, soon, I hope. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so thank you.